So, uh, hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of our knowledge based podcast series. Uh, this time we have with us Mr. Gautam Bell. Uh, Gautam sir does not need an introduction per se, as most of us know him because of his best selling book, The Choice of Compounding. Uh, Gautam sir is also the managing partner at Stellar Wealth Partners India Fund, which is a US based fund that helps US investors invest in Indian equities. Uh, Gautam sir is also an advisor to Complete Circle Stellar Wealth, which is a PMS based out of India. So, welcome, Gautam sir. Thank you, Ankush. Glad to be here. Uh, so, uh, in this podcast, we'll try to cover some of the broader aspects about investing and not get into specifics of how Gautam sir invests in, in terms of like say, stock selection, uh, selling, etc. Because I think a lot of that has already been covered by Gautam sir in his book. So, that uh, explains it much better than what we can try to cover in the podcast. Uh, before we begin, a uh, quick disclosure. Uh, Search Capital is a trade name, brand name used by me, uh, Ankush Agarwal. I'm a SEBI registered individual research analyst. Nothing that we discuss in this podcast today should be considered as a recommendation. Uh, kindly read more disclosures in the description below. Uh, Gautam, sir, if you can put out your disclosure and disclaimers that you want to share. Sure. So, uh, all these, any stock names, if they are discussed in this particular discussion, uh, they are not uh, recommendations to buy or sell. We may be holding some of those stocks in Stellar Wealth Partners India Fund or Complete Circle Stellar Wealth PMS. Uh, so, Gautam sir, let's start from the beginning. Uh, like, can you talk a bit about your journey in the markets? Like, when you started, what were some of the key initial experiences or some of the key uh, moments that shaped you? How uh, how you uh, work as an investor? So, broadly, a brief timeline of when you started in the markets till today. Just like many investors are entering the stock markets today uh, during the final euphoric phases of a you know four year old bull market. Similarly, even I was attracted to the uh, Indian stock markets towards the final euphoric phases of a raging, raging bull market. In my case, it was the 2003 to 2007 bull market in India. I distinctly remember I had bought a, a mutual fund called Reliance Power Sector Mutual Fund in December 2007. And I bought a stock named Ispath Steel in January 2008 because both of them were in the hot and fancied sectors of power and steel at the time. And I paid no attention to their valuations or business fundamentals. I simply, like any amateur investor, just extrapolated the recent price price trends in them. And I eventually paid the price. Both those investments crashed 70 to 80% over the next 12 to 18 months. And I successfully gained entry into the stock market by paying my admission fees. So that is basically how I got started. That's the story of most investors in the market. Initially, we do not really understand uh, yeah. the fundamentals of investing, but it's a, this is a field in which ex, real world experience is golden. So the more time you actually spend in the market and the more uh, patterns you form in your mind, once you develop the art of pattern recognition, then over time your uh, hit, your hit rate or your uh, success ratio basically keeps going up over time. So that's basically how I got started. Now, in spite of this initial setback, my interest and enthusiasm in the markets always remained very high. Throughout the first seven years of my professional job career, I started my career as an investment banking analyst with Citibank in Mumbai, where I worked for three years. Then I worked as a senior analyst in the investment banking team of Deutsche Bank for four years in Mumbai, London and Hong Kong. But one fine day I came to the realization that we just have this one short life to live our dreams. And even though I was making good money in those investment banking jobs, I was not really truly happy because the job satisfaction was not really there. All, all the time I used to just keep thinking about, you know, cracking this puzzle of investing. It was, it was this curiosity, this intense uh, hunger to figure out the puzzle that what exactly makes, uh, you know, a person tick in this particular investing field. Because many a times we do our MBA in finance, we do our CFA charter, we do our MS finance, and we start thinking of ourselves as the masters of the universe. But the market, after two, almost two decades in the market, have come to the realization that, the stock markets are the ultimate humbling machine. Always be humble or be ready to be humble. So, you know, one uh, in 2015, I quit my job in Deutsche and I was so keen for a career shift that I actually relocated to the US in May 2015 without any job in hand. Now, uh, my uh, relative sponsored my green card here and I was under the impression that since I'm a CFA charter holder, I'll easily get a stock market job because... Right. This particular degree is highly valued in the investment, uh, you know, uh, job market. But as you know, life is not a bed of roses for those trying to carve their own destiny. I was rejected in the first three stock market job interviews here in the first six months because I did not have any formal stock market work experience. I used to work on the private side previously in my jobs. So 
No, at the same time, I ran out of whatever little money I'd brought with me from India and to take care of my living expenses in the US. You know, I did not want to sell even a single share from my portfolio of Indian stocks because I did not want to interrupt the process of compounding. Okay. So I took up a minimum wage job as a front desk clerk at a hotel in San Francisco, uh, where I worked for the next one and a half years. And even though it was, you know, a big challenge for me intellectually, emotionally, physically, and culturally, Today, in hindsight, Ankush, I highly value those days of my life because for the first time since the beginning of my busy investment banking career, I finally got some free time for myself okay. to read and learn. And I, the pace of work at the hotel during my night shift was very slow. And I made full use of the time to read every single blog article published since inception on blogs like Safal, uh, safalneveshak.com, uh, funduprofessor.com, Base Hit Investing by John Huber, then um, there was a blog by Janav, janavwordpress.com, Microgap Club by Ian Castle. I read yeah. every single blog. And this is, you know, when my learning, my knowledge and learning really took off from a very tiny base. Yeah. And this is when you know, I really started the passionate pursuit of lifelong learning. Now, at this stage, I would just like to take a moment to talk to your audience about the importance of passion. I distinctly remember uh, every night I used to apply to three stock market jobs online. And if you simply do the math over those 15, 16 months, I remember I'd applied to more than 1,300 jobs online. Yeah. Now, as all of us know, especially at a younger age, that every time we take the time to you know, fill out the job, job application, attach yeah. our resume, every time we click the submit button, there is so much hope and anticipation attached behind every submission. And to be rejected for more than 1300 times and still keep on going, it's only possible if you're extremely passionate about what you want to pursue in life. Mm. And this is you know, when you realize the power of compounding because compounding will test your patience and conviction to the fullest before bestowing its magic upon you. So luck, chance, serendipity and randomness have always played a critical role in many aspects of my life till date. In November 2016, I randomly clicked on the quick apply button on a job application on LinkedIn and wonder of wonders, I was sh uh, shortlisted for the interview and that too for a senior role in an investment firm in Salt Lake City, Utah. And this is the phase in my life when I realized the power of compounding knowledge in action because over the previous 15, 16 months, all those hundreds of hours I had spent on educating myself and building that intellectual foundation and in investing. This is what was missing during the first three stock market job interviews in the US. This time I cracked all the three rounds of my job interview and I was uh, offered the role of portfolio manager at a mutual wow. fund in uh, Salt Lake City. Now, it was like a dream come true for me because never had I thought that I will land up in such a senior role straight away. I thought I'll start as a junior analyst, then get promoted to analyst, then to senior analyst, then to assistant portfolio manager and then finally reach a portfolio manager level after 13, 14 years. But that is basically you know, compounding in real life, playing out in front of you. So... I basically worked there for four and a half years from January 2017 till uh, uh, mid July 2021. And that particular period also coincided with a long 27 month long brutal bell market in small cap and mid cap stocks in India. Now, this is again good, you know, fortunate timing because, you know, when you're getting such, uh, such a large salary, you know, dollar salary, plus you're getting right. your yearly bonuses and when you also experience a bear market. Right. And you cannot get luckier than that because you then yeah. you get to invest large sums of rupee amounts and yeah. good quality mid cap small cap stocks in India throw evaluations in a bear market and then when those stocks go up five ten times in the next few years then right. that is when you finally achieve financial independence and you are able to quit your full time job so I quit my full time job in July two thousand twenty one spent the next one year on obtaining the FPI foreign portfolio investor license from SEBI set up Stellar Wealth Partners India Fund in Delaware, US. And in, after, in July 2022, we opened our uh, fund to the public and we launched on 3rd of October 2022. We'll complete uh, a full two years in the next two days uh, for the Stellar Wealth Partners India Fund. At the same time, because I cannot be a fund manager both in US and India at the same time, and a lot of NRIs and domestic Indian citizens wanted access to Stellar Wealth's investment philosophy. So I tied up with Complete Circle uh, Wealth Solutions in Delhi led by Gurmeet uh, Chadda and Shitish Majin. And I, and I joined them as an advisor on their P new PMS product called Complete Circle Stellar Wealth PMS. So that's basically a quick summary of my journey so far.
I mean, a lot of people actually don't realize how big of a role some of these blogs have played uh, in building the initial, you know, base for a lot. Like even my journey, like I started reading, say, Dr. Vijay Malik, Sapal Nivesha, Pandu Invest, all this were what let me build my initial base. And like in, in your case as well, like even when I did my CA, I thought, you know, I would get a job easily, but that never happened. And to me also, like Money Life, I used to read the blog. And one day there was an ad over there that analyst required. That's how I got into the professional role. So, I mean, what, I mean, reading these blogs and everything, I think it's very underappreciated in the sense of how much that can help after a given point. I mean, I mean, like the whole reason for starting this podcast and the knowledge base itself is because uh, I personally have been one of the beneficiary of some of these guys in the past who have started blogs and wrote their stuff, right? A lot of people actually have built their entire base because of that. So one question over here, Gautam sir. Uh, so you have always primarily invested in Indian markets and not in the US, like at least for your money? For my personal money, always India. In the US, uh, I used to hold one or two stocks in my personal uh, brokerage account here. But after I started my India fund, I realized that right. even if I have a small sum of money invested in the US market, Psychologically, I'm being, you know, yeah. being forced to focus on the US economy, the US stock markets on a day-to-day -day basis. I right. did not want any distractions. I wanted 100% focus uh, on my, you know, India fund here. So I sold whatever stocks I had here. And uh, now I you know all 100% of my personal money now in terms of investment portfolio is allocated in my India fund only. So, you know, I'm a great believer, Ankush, in the power of simplification and minimalism, which I've talked about in the jobs of compounding as well, that, you know, the, you know, in the first half of our lives, we tend to add, keep adding stuff. Right. And once we get wisdom by the, in, the, in our 40s, yeah. that is when we start subtracting stuff up from our life. So in my case, for instance, I just have my own fully owned home in US. I've got one bank account and I've got one single investment in my India fund. That's it. I've got not, That's right. my entire financial net worth right there. So you want to basically simplify because there's a lot of peace and serenity yeah. when you actually simplify, you know, things in life, you know, have your few close friends, have your few, uh, you know, few you know, focused uh, you know, objectives in life. And that is you know, greatly, you know, peaceful, basically. Okay. Right. So, uh, Gautam sir, can you talk a bit about your investor framework? Like if someone new has to, new person comes to you and asks you, you know, how do you invest Gautam? So how would you explain it to him? Like, how do you invest in the team? So that's a very good question, Ankush. And, you know, if you look, look at all the greatest investors in history and the great investors in the world today, all of them have got one common attribute, a relentless focus on the underlying process, you know, because, right. you know, traditionally there have been three sources of edge for investors. The first one was the informational edge, but now with the right. internet, information edge is gone. Second was the analytical edge, but you know, now with uh, you know, so many smart people entering the investing profession, you no, know, even the analytical edge is fast getting compressed, but behavior and temperament and a well-structured process, these are the last remaining, uh, you know, uh, I think competitive advantage left for the investor today. So now I'll talk in detail about the investment framework, which I follow for Stella Wealth Partners India Fund and for the PMS in India as well. Yeah. In the stock market, now this is the holy grail of investing. If your audience can understand, is invite this, they'll do very, very well. In the stock market, there are two, two kinds of companies. One with low returns on capital employed, one with high returns on capital employed. Okay. In case of the previous uh, category of companies with low returns on capital employed, the maximum delta, the maximum rate of change, the maximum growth in intrinsic value takes place when they focus on improving their return on capital employed. Because if they focus on growth, then if you're growing right. with, with, with earning a return on capital less than your cost of capital, you end up destroying shareholder value. So for those companies, they basically... Uh, prosper, the shareholders prosper when they focus on improving their ROC. This, these kind of companies are identified by a framework of variant perception. So what is variant perception? Variant perception refers to situations where you get ROC expansion coupled with earnings growth that leads to valuation re-rating and that is how you get multi-baggers. And variant perception comes from having a differentiated view on the short to medium term trajectory of a business. And there are multiple triggers for varying perception. Number one, product mix change into a higher margin category. One of the easiest ways to understand uh, this is basically in the conference call, management themselves will tell you words like, we want to improve, increase the proportion of value added products in our product mix. So in these cases, what will happen? The net profit growth 
grows much more faster than your revenue growth. That's the first source of varying perception. Second source of varying perception, operating leverage, which can come from having high and utilized capacity just at the beginning of an industry upcycle, very relevant for cyclical and commodity businesses. Third source of varying perception, regulatory change. I'll give you a past example here. So in March 2022, the Reserve Bank of India greatly expanded expanded the total addressable market for microfinance companies and BFC uh, microfinance institutions by allowing them to have 25% of their uh, total AUM in non-microfinance yeah. loans. Yeah. Okay, so that expanded the total addressable market. Plus RBI removed the uh, net interest margin cap of 10% as well. So as a result, what happened over the next two years, you saw so many MFI stocks becoming multi-baggers. Yeah. Now they're having, you know, obviously they're facing a uh, cyclical downturn with uh, asset quality issues. So they're getting derated rightly. But for two years, you could have made a lot of money just by focusing yeah. on this particular varying perception trigger of regulatory change. The next source of uh, varying perception is debt reduction or deleveraging. Because as debt goes down, interest cost goes down, net profit goes up, market cap goes up. Also, because debt is a part of capital employed, as debt yeah. goes down, your return on capital automatically goes up. The next source for variant uh, perception is working capital improvement. So like, again, a good past example would be April Apollo tubes. After yeah. COVID, they used to a cash and carry model. Cash working model. capital cycle got crunched down. That freed up a lot of cash, improved their our ROC. Stock became a multi-bagger after that. One more source of variant perception, improvement in asset turns. So there are two sources for uh, ROC expansion, improvement in asset turns. Or, or margin improvement. And between the two, I prefer the former because high, mar high margins lead to you know, a more increased competition. You can easily get the information from management on conference calls that what is going to be the expected turnover of the new fixed asset capacity. Along with the, these uh, you know, varying perce perception triggers, you also have corporate actions. Now, without within corporate actions, now this is a very interesting area of the market, which is just now, which is now getting discovered slowly, slowly. So within this corporate actions, uh, field, you have got demergers, you have merger arbitrage, you have promoter and management change, and finally you have divestiture of a loss making or non-core business segment or a low ROC segment. So like, I will just quickly touch upon these four very quickly. So in case of demergers, there are basically three kinds of uh, situations where you get forced selling after the demerger takes place. And that is when basically when the forced selling element takes place, that is when you can make a lot of uh, alpha. So forced selling can take place because of a market cap demerger or a sectoral demerger or a uh, forced selling by index fund. So let's talk talk about market cap demerger first. Arti surfactants demerge from Arti Industries. Arti Industries was a mid cap stock. Arti surfactants listed as a macro cap stock. Mid cap small cap funds could not hold Arti Industries, so they were forced to dump Arti surfactants at a ridiculously cheap price. Once the selling pressure from these funds got over. Not only did the you know did you notice the promoters uh, increasing their stake in the company, you know the market cap of the the enterprise value of the business had you know become lower than the book value of the plant and machinery on the books. That is how cheap the stock had become. The stock subsequently gave more than five hundred percent returns in the next uh, one year from there. This was a market cap demerger. What is a sectoral demerger? So Jubilant uh, Ingrevia and Jubilant Pharma Nova got demerged from Jubilant Life Sciences. And because that uh, particular company, Jubilant Life Sciences, was primarily held by pharma funds, when they got uh, this chemical stock, Jubilant and Gravia, in their uh, portfolio after the demerger, by virtue of their legal mandate, they were not allowed to hold on to a chemical stock. So they again had to dump Jubilant and Gravia at a, you know, down to very depressed uh, valuation levels. Once you, when the selling pressure got over, the stock tripled over the next uh, six months. Now let's talk about index fund selling. Here you can get a live case study of Raymond Lifestyle. Raymond Limited was part of many index funds, but Raymond Lifestyle, when they could receive shares of Raymond Lifestyle, they again engaged in forced selling. And now you're having uh, Raymond Lifestyle trading at a enterprise value to EBITDA of 13 times, where, while peers like Aditya Birla Fashion Retail are trading at 30 times EV EBITDA, Trend is trading at 100 times EV EBITDA. Once this forced selling gets, gets over, then what will happen? This PMS funds, family offices, when they, they will first start buying, and after that, even uh, more larger investors will start buying because they will then start comparing the valuation multiples of this particular listed entity with the comparable peers. That's basically how you know, the markets actually work in reality. We do not own this stock in our uh, PMS or India fund because of the corporate governance issues, but the stock is trading pretty cheap at the current yeah. price. So that's about demergers. Now, 
merger arbitrage. So this has been a very uh, effective strategy for generating returns in our fund in the last two years. We first bought Equitas Holding because there was a merger arbitrage with Equitas Small Finance Bank. Then we yeah. bought Ujjivan Financial because there was a merger arbitrage with Ujjivan yeah. Small Finance Bank. Currently, we are holding Inox Wind Energy Limited in a, both our PMS and India fund because when we bought the stock, uh, it's going to be basically be you know, merged with Inox Wind and there was a 40% merger arbitrage on the table. Only the NCLT approval remains now. So once that happens, you also basically end up making good amount of returns with low risk. Now, when you're investing in merger arbitrage situations, you want to make sure that the you know the underlying business, basically, which is, you know, that the underlying business has to be enjoying a sectoral tailwind. So when we invested in Equitas Holding and Ujjian Financial, microfinance industry and uh, NBFCs were having a tailwind. Now they're having worsening asset quality issues. So really, Inox Wind right now is enjoying the tailwind from the renewable energy push. So basically, when you engage in this merger arbitrage situation, just make sure that the underlying business is having good fundamentals or good tailwinds in place. The third thing uh, uh, was promoter and management change. Now, this is a very powerful trigger for generating alpha in the Indian markets because, and this tends to work, especially in situations where the business being taken over has got a good underlying asset or a good underlying distribution network or a good business, but is being mismanaged or badly managed. The more badly managed the business, when the new promoter takes over, the higher the scope for re-rating and the higher the scope for alpha generation. You will not make the big money in promoter management change situations when the underlying business is already you know uh, performing very well. For example, when Sovin Pharma was uh, taken yeah. over recently, the underlying business anyways was doing very, very well. That's why the stock did yeah. not really give you any great returns after the uh, takeover happened. But you know, the worse the, worse the uh, business uh, situation, the greater the chances of uh, the valuation re-rating. And finally, you have got divestiture of a non-core business segment. Once you divest a non-core business unit, the market rewards you with a, the focus business with a higher valuation multiple. Yeah. And when you divest uh, the loss making business, then automatically the net profit goes up. Your yeah. uh, Basically, your market cap also goes up. And finally, divestiture of a low ROIC or negative ROIC business. Penar Industries, just a stock, stock example, we do not own this stock in our yeah. funds. They are actually, you know, when a management sh- is divesting a low ROIC business and becoming smaller, generally... Most management, most managements in India have this tendency of they want to build an empire, yeah. even if it's yeah. value destructive. But right. if you can find the management focus on capital allocation, improving the ROIC, that is when you basically you know you know that you know you're, you're in good hands. So Penar Industries is basically divesting its low ROIC business to improve their overall RO. Uh, you know, C. Uh, look at the Aditya Birla group of companies. What has happened in the last two years? Yeah. Throughout the group, there's a renewed uh, vigor and energy on improving their return on capital employed. And we have had so much re-rating happening in those stocks as well. So be on the lookout for these changes. So all these examples I gave you right now, various catalysts, all form part of varying perception framework. That's the first one. Second kind of companies in the stock market are those with high returns on capital employed. Okay. And for those kind of companies, the maximum delta, the maximum rate of change and the maximum growth in intrinsic value takes place when they focus on improving their revenue growth. So these kind of opportunities are found in long-term structural trends. Okay, Long-term structural trends are found in industries with a very favorable structure. They're organized like a monopoly or a duopoly or an oligopoly at best. And they're enjoying some form of an industry tailwind. They are cons- characterized by consistency and predictability of cash flows, and they have a long runway for growth. So you have visibility for many years ahead. They are also characterized by value migration. So in India, for the last 30 years, we have had value migration from unorganized to organized, public sector to uh, private sector, from offline to online. And today there are multiple mega trends and structural trends in the Indian market, including affordable housing finance, financialization of savings, branded discretionary consumption, renewable energy or energy transition, music streaming, fintech, artificial intelligence, multiple mega trends are in place. So basically a portfolio well constructed is one in which the majority of the portfolio is built up of these long-term structural trends to provide you long-term compounding. And with a certain part of the portfolio having those varying perception bets to generate alpha. Those are more shorter term tactical opportunities. In common investing parlance, we call this the core satellite investing framework. I think that's very interesting. So broadly, what you're saying is in a already good business with good metrics, focus on acceleration of growth. And in a business that is not so good at the moment, rather than looking at growth, 
you focus on improvement in ROIC, and that is where you'll make money. Yeah. Right, right. I mean, that's actually, uh, I mean, the way you explain it made a lot of sense. I mean, uh, that in case of not so good business, rather than looking at a lot of other things, focus on where the ROIC can improve. Uh, but then, so one of the most important questions that I wanted to ask about is the pure book. Like, what made you write a book? And how was the whole process like? Uh, because see, writing obviously brings a lot of clarity and it's something that helps a lot. But writing a book is a notch higher in terms of writing because there you need a lot more clarity and understanding to, uh, you know, uh, provide that, uh, explain that uh, framework or, you know, anything, you know, defined set of words. So can you talk a bit about how this whole process of writing was helpful to you in, in, in what comes? Obviously, it would have brought a lot of clarity, but what else were some of the advantages that you got by writing your book? I think, uh, you know, I'll talk about the advantages which I've got by writing the book. But before that, I'll just give you a quick background about, you know, how the JAWS of Compounding came into being. So right. in November 2016, I joined Twitter and I just immediately started tweeting whatever I was reading, whatever videos I was watching. I started tweeting my thoughts on various subjects like philosophy, psychology, history, investing, many things. And within a few months, you know, two uh, people from India, they were visiting US. They actually flew down to Salt Lake City, Utah, when I was working in Summit Global. They came down to meet me. And they were the ones who suggested to me the idea of uh, actually, why don't you write right. a book? They told me, why don't you just write a book? And I just, I just thought, at that time, my only thought was that, okay, if I, if I already had the habit of, you know, uh, share, you know, posting the links to my favorite articles and blogs in a Word document and also my favorite quotes, I used to just keep copying and pasting them into a Word document. I, had this, I still have this habit today that I like to just document whatever, you know, great things I'm reading and whatever great thoughts I come across. So I thought, okay, I already have the content. I all, all that I need to do is just organize this into a, you know, nice, uh, you know, book format and then public self pub, self publish it and the only idea at that time was to give back to the investment com investment community from whom i had gotten to learn so much over the years so when i self published the joys of compounding i just basically made sold it for zero royalty i just i just paid out of i paid for all the costs of printing publishing editing of my own pocket and i just thought okay maybe it'll sell a few hundred copies and i may get in touch with some like minded people and you know it'll be good to yeah. meet up with some like-minded people that was the only thought process then but that book just uh you know the self-published edition sold very well and uh, when i was in Oma in uh, may 2018 during the berkshire hathaway annual meeting what happened was the book was basically the book what ian castle and sean idings of macro cap club were yeah. going to uh, be given a seat at the table at, at creating university to sell their book, The Intelligent Fanatics, but they dropped out of that at the last minute. So Sean Eidings and me had a conversation and he just suggested to me, why don't you reach out to the Omaha Airport bookstore uh, manager? You know, he may, you know, give you a seat, a seat at Creating University and he may also keep a few copies of your book uh, in the Omaha Airport bookstore. I said, okay, let me reach out to him, Jim Ross. And then he was kind enough to oblige and uh, give me a seat at the table for author book signing uh, at Creighton University, where I got to actually sit beside one of my investing mentors, Guy Spire, and both of us were sitting together and signing books for readers together. It was a very uh, great moment. And again, I know, like I keep talking about this aspect of luck, chance, serendipity, and randomness. Because the Joyce of Compounding self-published edition started selling out like hotcakes in the Oma Airport bookstore, Jim Ross, the store manager, called up Miles Thompson, from Columbia Business School Publishing in New York and told him, you know, Miles, you have to come down to Omaha. There's something really big happening here. This new author's book is just selling out in our store. And, you know, I think we may all, I think, you know, we may be onto something here. So Miles Thompson, the very big name in the publishing industry here in the US, he actually flew down to Omaha and he met me at Creighton University right there. And uh, then he offered me a publishing contract and publishing opportunity with Columbia Business School. And, as we all know, all the students of value investing know, Columbia Business School is where value investing actually originated yeah. because Benjamin Graham used to teach them. So it was always a quiet dream to work with Columbia someday on a book. And here my dream was being realized. So that again, yeah. you know, and the rest is history with Columbia's, you know, global distribution muscle and marketing might. The joys of compounding, the joys of compounding today is an international bestseller in eight countries across the world yeah. and on the verge of becoming a bestseller, bestseller in additional two countries. 
So that is basically the entire story of how the you know, book became such a big success. Again, none of this was expected, anticipated. But because of the success of the book, what has happened? The media visibility has greatly increased. Now I get invited on various YouTube channels, podcast channels, TV shows, and you know, get invited to share my views on stock sectors and business fundamentals. So obviously the credibility and trust has gone up tremendously because of the book. And that's why I encourage people that, you know, when you're, you know, in this particular industry, Ankush, money has become a commodity, honestly speaking. Yeah. The only thing which is left for us to sell now to clients is our investment philosophy and process and trust yeah. and credibility. Yeah. So, so in investment philosophy and process are good of many people, but how do you build that trust and credibility to scale up? If you open a PMS or a small case or an AIF or a hedge fund, you have to, how do you raise capital and how do you get clients? For that, you have to build credibility. So for, I've shared multiple avenues through which you can actually build up that uh, credibility and trust. In my second book, The Making of a Value Investor, and there, there are so many avenues today in today's digital age that you, know, you can really build up a following over time. It's all about consistency. No, look at, you know, like there are you know, certain YouTubers who basically started off with a small subscriber base, but because they just kept at it day in, day right. out on a daily basis, now they've got subscribers of, you know, four to five lakh subscribers on the YouTube channel. It's all about consistency. I think that is what the you know key to compounding is just start and then just keep on going. Because if you keep on doing good work, so one day or the other, you will be noticed. Right. Uh, so Gautam, so what I wanted to ask clear on the book was, like while writing uh did like i mean on a regular basis we practice a lot of things we have read a lot of things which are, are there in the back of our mind but while writing did that brought a lot of more clarity on some of the aspects and now like does it become like a ready reckoner for you like if you're not uh like for example you're in the middle of making a sell decision on some stock so you know you refer to your book to get a more clarity on that, like how does it work? Like, does it become a manual for your own investing now? Very much, very much. Not only my books, there are many other books uh, which basically I refer to. Uh, so, so you know, basically the selling, you talked about selling, for example, you know, you know when yeah. you want to basically sell a stock, it can be for any any of multiple yeah. reasons. It can be absolutely expensive valuations. For example, the stock is trading at more than 100 times next year's earnings. Or there's a gross capital misallocation. Small capital misallocation steps are okay, but any gross capital misallocation can be a sell trigger. Any very bad corporate governance practice, that's another sell trigger. And also the final trigger for selling is, suppose you know you uh, the stock is promising you 15 to 20% return over the next three years CAGR, but you find a small cap stock with excellent fundamentals, great promoter, which can grow at 35-40% over the next three to four years. There you get potential of P re rating also. And higher growth also. So you may, in very rare cases, you may sell an existing holding because you found a far superior opportunity. So those are the four uh, you know, uh, situations that you can sell. But yes, at, I do re refer to old books, not only my own. There are, uh, For example, right now we are in a euphoric phase in the market. We saw what happened with, I think there was a SME called Resource Automobile, 12 crore IPO, about 5,000 crores of subscription. Yeah. That was, you know, clearly flashing red in my view that I decided, okay, I have to keep my mind sane. I need to refer to the great, great classics and just read them to remain humble and keep my feet on the ground, not get carried away, not get diverted from my existing philosophy. So I read The Intelligent Investor with uh, Jason Zweig's uh, commentary. He talked about how so many dot-com stocks you know, went bust after the tech bubble. And then I read uh, a book, uh, A Short History of Financial Euphoria by John Kenneth Galbraith. That was a good, very good book. I also read a great book on the Indian stock market's history called Bulls, Bears and Other Beasts by Atosh Nair. That also was very, very helpful. And uh, I also read a book called Devil uh, Take the Hindmost uh, by, I think it was by Edward Chancellor. So those basically books, you know, at the, and also I read uh, Mastering the Market Cycle by Howard Marks. So these five books, I basically reread all my underlined portions and my notes in those books recently in the last one month or two, just to keep my mind sane. Not and also yeah. I read the making of a value investor, my second book, just to yeah. make sure that I do not repeat the same mistakes which I made in the 2013 to 2017 bull market in India. Because so there are four key risks in investing, and the Indian market periodically forgets one of these four risks. The first yeah. one is business risk. During the 2003 to 2007 bull market in real estate, yeah. infrastructure, and commodities, the markets forgot that these industries do not have recurring revenues. Second risk which the market periodically forgets is regulatory risk. 
during 2009 to 2015 bull market in pharmaceuticals the market did not the regulatory risk which these uh, businesses had the third risk is promoter risk the most biggest risk in indian stock market during the 2013 to 2017 <laughs> bull market you know yeah. people thought that you know uh, you know that there was this chore bane more, uh, more yeah. going around yeah. and you know people overlooked corporate governance risk and they paid the price yeah. in 2018 19 and yeah. finally valuation risk in 2018 19 yeah. people thought that you could buy large cap quality stocks at any price and still make money people overlooked valuation risk so yeah. periodically you, you keep forgetting one of these four risks and then when the bear market eventually starts then you pay the price but only after going through the pain of a couple of such cycles that is right. when you mature as an investor and you resist going down the quality curve that is basically yeah. you know when you truly become a mature and calm investor actually this was a thing that i wanted to ask like uh, given that you have read uh, wrote an entire book on your day to day journal of uh, going through a bear market like what are some of the do's and not do's that an investor should do during a bear market so a bear market has started what an investor should do in a bear market and what he should not do first thing which you should not do is do not average down on certain kinds of businesses which i have again talked about in my second book the making of a value investor yeah. you should not average down on on uh, operationally levered business models like commodities you should not op- average down on levered business models like banking or lending businesses you should should not uh, uh, average down on biz- businesses facing technological or technical obsolescence you absolutely must not uh, average down on levered businesses involving fraud these are the four cases which you should not do do not uh, average down here but you asked about what you should do you should average down or basically buy stocks at lower prices for structural growth businesses basically which you know which have got good uh, corporate governance good promoters and good healthy prospects over the long term short term their growth may be impacted by the economy but in the long run if you know that okay they will create value those are the kind of stru- businesses which you should uh, invest in and the advantage of investing in the structural growth businesses especially the consumer facing businesses in india is if you are able to identify a small cap or a mid cap business with able management operating in a consumer facing business and one which has got access to lots of data data is like a gold mine i talked about this in the second book as well that you know it just you know ages well with time so basically the more data you capture you know you can then monetize it in so many multiple ways that's one optionality which the markets cannot price up front for management that can scale so that's one second in a consumer facing company sometimes there are some uh, embedded optionalities some managements are basically seeding new business ventures in those uh, companies which the you know market is not ascribing any value to, value to today but those new business ventures are put such a large addressable market if they are adjacent or basically what we call pivoting into adjacencies if they are yeah. very adjacent to the core business that is a source for great value creation because then the terminal value expands terminal value is where 80 to 90% of a business basically resides and if you for, i'll give you a live example here we own this stock in our india fund and our pms ethos limited yeah. luxury watch retailer now they are seeding two new businesses of premium luggage luxury jewelry like right? perfect adjacent area to their core business of luxury watch retailing so if they are able to even uh, succeed in even one of these two ventures and if they venture, succeed in both then you can just imagine because of the yeah. huge scale, uh, size of opportunity in both these industries what can what can take place over the next 10 years that is why yeah, if you are if you were able to think about this possibility you know a, a year ago when the stock was trading at 50 p today the stock is almost at 100 p trailing yeah. eps you already the market is you know basically you know factoring in the the, the longevity of growth because the right. market knows that okay this company has got a good track record of uh, luxury watch retailing so they have their existing they can simply sell this two additional categories to their existing customer base and both of them you have seen yeah. in premium in luggage industry we have seen the kind of value creation from safari industries already yeah. we have seen the value creation from kalyan and titan so we have got case studies of value creation from those two industries and you have a management which has proven its ability to scale so you know again you know once the market uh, you know starts uh, discounting this optionality then basically the, val- the kind of valuation multiples you get it just uh, through the roof we have seen a past uh, instance of astral poly when they venture into yeah. adhesive and other building products yeah. happened to the valuation multiple so first the management has to execute prove to the market that they have a track record of value creation and execution 
then when they start seeding those new business, business ventures and you start getting the uh, you know up, uptake from there as well okay no that is absolutely right because i mean in companies who can keep building on new businesses the terminal value keeps expanding and that's how you get that exceptional re rating that you have so some of the highest trading multiple of companies that keep that that those have a history of creating new businesses obviously i mean and in, in case of ethos also i mean a lot of people are not recognize the fact that custom duty are going to reduce to zero over the next zero. seven years so mm-hmm. yeah yeah uh another question over here gautam sir is that uh we are at a stage stage in the market wherein you know there is an equally strong balanced opinion on people who have taken large cash calls right and equally strong opinion on people who are fully invested thinking that uh the market will continue right so can you t- talk a bit about this whole aspect of taking cash calls and what else can an investor do to prepare themselves from bear market rather than just simply going for taking cash calls i think uh, you have to have you know a very strong uh, foundation in financial market history so recently i came across a tweet which mentioned that since inception of the nifty in the sensex every time the monthly rsi of nifty has crossed 80 yeah you know, the market no crash six times in the history no today no nifty no rsi is at yeah. i think it was debashi i think and today the rsi monthly rsi of nifty is at 84 now yeah. the margin of error basically it's obvious that in the markets are overbought and when the margin of error is so low it just takes one external event it will not be a domestic event you know if the yeah. in fact we can also have a domestic event as well see if the bjp gets wiped out in haryana maharashtra jammu yeah. kashmir all the other you know big states then if nitesh and i do withdraw the support we have had many instances of coalition governments yeah. collapsing you will see a huge derating of all these b2g businesses and power stocks and renewable energy stocks and defense stocks railway stocks they'll half within no time so the idea is no as you asked what is the what should an investor do right now first of all start preparing for improbable scenarios like i mentioned right now the, the domestic trigger is the collapse of the indian government the external trigger is if uh, after today's uh, missile attack by iran on israel right. israel retaliates and us also joins the war because israel is the uh, ally and if you end up in a, in a very big uh, regional middle east war situation then yeah. even oil prices because iran is such a major yeah. exporter of oil yeah. indian mid cap and small cap stock we he know this from history they are very yeah. sensitive to sharp surge in oil prices because right. margin uh, deterioration takes place across the board valuation derating starts plus the rbi's hand, hand will be then tied very bad big time as it is they are concerned about food inflation now they'll further get right. in, concerned about oil price inflation shock so in right. that case you know the market may derate so that one, on one side you have this external event which can happen on the other hand you have this domestic a big event which may happen you know just be prepared look review your portfolio right now like you know recently me and the complete circle team and uh, we basically reviewed our portfolio and we came across a list of five stocks which are very sensitive to the indian government being in place right now and we've already come out with substitutes or you know which stocks will we will replace them with in case of a congress led coalition government comes to power what will happen because you know you have to change uh, you know you have to change yeah. the composition of your portfolio to align with the you know uh, where the government's focus is you have to right. take cognizance of these things so a congress led coalition will give con- you know stimulus a lot of stimulus subsidies boost domestic consumption consumer staples branded consumer discretionary which have been lagging for the last couple of years they may start out performing so you know basically you have to have this plan in place right now that okay if these things happen what am i going to substitute my portfolio stocks with so these are you know some things which you should do right now as regards the cash calls you know Uh, you have to have a good idea about market cycles so generally bull market cycles in india if you look at uh, you know between 89 and 1992 you had a three year three three and a half year long bull market yeah. then a crash then uh, you had a bull market from 1998 to march 2000 to and a half years and then i had a yeah. crash and you had a bull market from 2003 to 2007 four years yeah. long bull market and then a big crash then you had a bull market from december 2013 to december 2017 four years long bull yeah. market in small cap mid cap then yeah. again a big crash now yeah. this latest bull market started in april 2020 already yeah. four and a half years have passed okay. it's right. an aged right. bull market and valuations are extremely expensive across the board so again you should be mentally prepared for a very big fall you know provided one of these two external events which i talked about happened in 2000 you know every time there's a pin to break these bubbles yeah. 
and you just have to be mentally prepared that okay this can happen let me not compromise on the quality of my portfolio let me practice prudent diversification across industries and risk factors let me not compromise on corporate governance let me not buy into risky micro caps deep cyclicals commodities or bad corporate governance stocks or highly leveraged leveraged balance sheet companies just avoid superities if you hold on to a good quality portfolio you know you may you know uh, experience some price correction but you will not have permanent loss of capital because in my experience over the last 18 years i've seen in india you know as long as you invest in good high quality uh, growth stocks they correct they may correct in line with the index or slightly more than the, than the index but as soon as the market stabilizes yeah, the report yeah. always goes back to all time at the fastest and when you're running an asset yeah. management business And this is an attribute which is very very important for clients that you know when as soon as the market stabilizes and recover your portfolio should be among the fastest to recover back to all time highs so you have to focus on quality of the business and the quality of the stocks when you are managing public money like you cannot compromise there because right. if you invest in bad quality stocks and you end up with permanent loss of capital even if your overall portfolio uh, returns are decent your clients will not forgive you if you lose 80 90% on a single stock by compromising on the quality that's not right. acceptable unfortunately when you're managing public money right. Right. so gotham sir will you take cash call like it is it a thing that you believe in like taking large cash call right now in my uh, hedge fund what i'm doing is basically the last uh, four clients uh, money which has come in basically i'm not investing in any of my existing uh, portfolio uh, portfolio stocks and simply letting cash accumulate naturally on on its okay. own and uh, in the in the pms we are basically going slow on onboarding new clients and even for the new clients which are coming in we are going to deploy the cash a bit slowly at these levels we are still waiting hope you know hopefully you know see the just to give you an idea of how resilient the indian market has been to our uh, surprise you had a coalition government coming to power on june 4th right. small cap index crash 10% recovered in the next uh, few nice. days yeah. on july 23rd you had a huge increase in short term capital gains tax and yeah. an increase in the long term capital gains tax ltcg stg yeah. both increased both. markets fell small cap mid cap fell again recovered in a week yeah. then in august japanese nikkei index fell 22% in one week our uh, small cap mid cap index fell 5 6% again recovered back to yeah. uh, all time high so you know it's very surprising to old timers and experienced people in the markets you know we are just catching it as to how is it possible that these three events together happened you have a coalition government coming to place you are having hike in xtcg long ltcg you are having a japanese market crash all these three three three, three combined still the markets are at all time high so yeah. bull, like they say bull markets climb a wall of worry if this is not a wall of worry i don't know what is a wall of worry plus you are having right. 23000 crores of sib money coming in into the markets yeah. so this is you know all the signs you know are there and promoter selling stake sales are at 2007 levels yeah, in terms yeah, of percentage yeah. of as a percentage of secondary sales so all these signals are flashing red this is the time basically you know you if you know it's fine to see, let cash accumulate and you know or deploy cash slowly because the margin for error at these valuations is very very low you know unfortunately you know you the clients expect you to to invest when you're managing public yeah. money you cannot sit on large sums of cash you have to invest unfortunately but you know you cannot just be 100% invested at this stage you have to have some cash uh, in your portfolio it may vary some people and in the big picture uh, at the end of the day in the big picture scheme of things it will not really matter if you hold 5 10% cash it's not going to make a big difference to your returns anyways but you just get a bit of psychological comfort from it that's the only thing which okay. don't happen i think you know eventually when the fall happens all of us will be taken aback because it will be sudden it will be by an unexpected trigger but okay. when it happens you just you know have to take the pain along with the game i guess right i mean that that's the theme of the market over last few years right i mean every risk indicator is flashing red right and anyone who has been in the market professionally or you know for a good period of time for him it's always like a bitter jittery that you know anyone who's like risk is actually an opportunity cost in this market like people are getting paid to take risk and someone is trying to uh, you know be a little conservative and even reduce the risk they are getting a huge opportunity cost that's there uh godam sir another thing like over last say 5 6 years or 7 years like after the initial you know leg of your investing career and now like from the midpoint to now has there been some important changes that you have made in your investing framework or style or how you approach the market so if you can talk a bit about them and what made you make that changes very good question again ankush so 
like all investors basically i started out by reading benjamin graham's the intelligent investor yeah. and i got attracted to statistically cheap securities of mediocre or bad quality businesses for many years prior to december 2017 i invested in you know uh, deep cyclicals commodity stocks micro caps because i was looking for statistical cheapness but the bear market from january 2018 to march 2020 ingrained in my mind the importance of resilience and longevity which are the key to compounding and henceforth i would you know return of capital would take precedence for me over return on capital so capital preservation and a focus on quality would you know take uh, precedence for me after that entire episode because i realized that you know when the market cycle is on your side and stock prices are going up you don't yeah. then you you know feel very intelligent but like the saying goes right. never mistake brains for a bull market, bull market. So basically it was only in hindsight that i realized that i was investing the wrong way prior to december 2017 if you want to succeed in the indian market quality with growth and uh, preferably with some embedded optionalities that is the way to go go for resilient business model the more resiliency you build into your portfolio the better off you will be because they tend to fall less in bear markets and they recover back equally fast when the markets recover basically that is the you know key to long term wealth creation you no know, and a lot of people make a large paper fortunes in bull markets but eventually lose all of it when the bear market eventually arrives mm-hmm. and how much you are able to retain after the recovery from a bear market is far more important than how much paper profit you make during a bull market and quality of business and quality of management matters the most in retaining and growing long term wealth so the first learning is that of focusing on quality the second thing which i learned after that uh, bear market of 27 months from jan 2018 to march 2020 was the perils of being overly concentrated in one single sector so you know risk surfaces from places you can never imagine yeah. and even if you are for, ex- for instance even if you are very careful in crossing the road by looking left and right a drone might still kill you from above The, f- the only way to defend yourself or protect yourself against an unknown future is prudent diversification that's why in our india fund and in our pms we hold between 20 and 25 stocks a lot at all points of time diversified across industries and risk factors you want to avoid exposure to single factor risk you also have individual stock level limits of 15% of aum in a single stock and industry level exposures are capped at 30% and all these you know hard filters are important because you don't want a single industry or a single promoter to det- determine the fortunes of your yeah. client so over time these are the finer nuances seem very element- elementary now but many you know investors when they enter the market they basically look for statistical cheapness or yeah. they have you know, overly you know concentrate on one single theme in vogue for example if renewable energy is in vogue then you are having only solar energy stocks in your for portfolio or if power is in you know, or if uh, artificial intelligence is in work then you are having only ai stocks you want to have certain parts of your portfolio underperforming because that will tell you that you are well diversified so okay. for a good portfolio what will happen is probably one third will be underperforming one third will be performing in line with the indices and one third will be outperforming that's a healthy diversified portfolio so that and i've talked about this in my second book as well uh, that you know nowadays sector rotation takes place at such a fast pace that yeah. no good manager or investor can afford to be disproportionately overweight on a single stock or sector and you know diversification helps you avoid fomo and helps you maintain patience by letting you participate in a variety of tailwinds in many of your stocks while tolerating the headwinds in a few of your portfolio holdings yeah. so i think prudent prudent diversification along with a focus on quality is the way to go finally that biggest advantage and kush of investing in quality stocks is that it it empowers you and enables you to view market corrections as buying yeah, opportunity right. if you are buying junk stocks then you know then you will start panicking you'll have stress right. and you know in this business i've realized i've learned one thing, big thing from buffett and munger that you know rule number 1 never lose money but rule number 2 live a long and healthy life and to live a long and healthy mm-hmm. life you have to focus on stress yeah. adjusted returns minimize right. stress it's only after many years of stress that we realize uh, the importance of this but you know i have made a mistake i wouldn't want other people to make the same mistake try to you know minimize stress in your investing and trading endeavors because otherwise that stress will start percolating percolating down into your personal and social life and that will hamper the longevity of your life you don't want that to happen you want to live as long as possible and keep playing this game this intellectual game of investing for the longest time longest period possible period. I mean, one very interesting point you made that you know, unless a part of your portfolio is underperforming, you are not well diversified. Yeah. 
I mean, that's a nice way to put it. Uh, so, uh, Gautam sir, since you have a US based fund which uh, primarily invests US investors' money into India, uh, so what I want to understand is uh, how are these investors looking at uh, investing in India as an opportunity? especially the valuation aspect of it, because Indian market historically has always been slightly relatively richly valued. So uh, how, like if some of these investors come to you, how do you address this uh, question on, you know, the large divergence between valuations that Indian stocks get? So if you can talk a bit about it. And has, right. has there been any change in past few years uh, in terms of perception or comfort that these investors have in investing in India? They already they always had the comfort of investing in India. That, that was never a problem. The problem, like, like you rightly uh, alluded to, was about valuations. So I've specifically addressed this very query in my second book. Uh, I've talked about why the valuations of in the Indian stock markets are not comparable to that of the Western and developed world. It's because in India, you know, the, you have got the highest levels of promoter holding and insider ownership. As a result, the co- supply of quality equities in the Indian market is very limited. Right. That's one. Okay, so that, that there's, there are different demand supply dynamics at play in the Indian market. And as a result, quality with growth in India is always available at a expensive or very expensive valuation. That's the trend for the last 20 years. You go back 20 years in time, you'll yeah. see the same trend every single year in the, in the Indian market. As soon as, because they're so rare and few in numbers, the few managements which can execute get sky high valuations in the Indian market because there's so few of them. And this is you know something which you know uh, this uh, foreign investors basically like when I give them the num- the hard numbers of value creation then that is when they start realizing this. So just to give you a very uh, incredible eye opening data point between 1990 and 2020 over 30 years 30 long years listen to this carefully mm-hmm. only one percent of all listed equities in India accounted for hundred percent of the market cap creation between those 30 wow. long years. And in the US, from 1926 to 2016, over 90 long years, only 4% of all listed stocks accounted for 100% of the market cap creation. What is it telling us? That once you have found the goose that leads the golden eggs, don't yes. kill the goose, let it ride you. Once you, because these, because the return generating stocks are so few in number, they will always appear optically expensive. But, you know, again, yes. this is something which I've talked about in my second book as well, that you know, the market tends to keep discounting earnings many years out, you know, because yeah. there's a pe- continuous PE rating which keeps on taking place as the management keeps on executing and, and and basically incubating new ventures and the terminal value keeps on expanding. That is why, you know, you the optically entry PE P multiples are actually not that high if the management can scale up, execute and also pivot into ad- adjacencies and also develop new optionalities. I think this is called the art of investing you will not understand this by looking at an excel spreadsheet or yeah. looking at the screener tools you have to have a feel for you know what the business can be like and can one of the biggest like. satisfactions yeah. in the investing world uh, yeah Shai, absolutely the world views a business the same way you yeah. viewed it three to four years ago yeah 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 absolutely absolutely uh, another thing Gautam saw over here is that uh, you have stated multiple times that you know your funds are modeled after Buffett partnership fee model. You also have a, a letter signed by Warren Buffett himself that has pinned on your Twitter profile. So can you talk a bit about this model and what how exactly it benefits investors? Basically, you know, uh, you know, like Buffett has taught us, emotions and expenses are the two biggest enemies for investors. They, they include right. investor clients as well. So, you know, uh, when I, I simply thought to myself, okay, if I want to invest in a fund, what would I like to see in that particular fund? I would like to see a zero management fee or zero fixed fees. I don't want to pay the manager which for just for breathing and just for, even if, the, if he makes losses for me, he still gets paid a management fee that I'd, I'm not comfortable with. So that's why I put the zero management fee structure number one. Second thing I'm looking for is a hurdle rate, annual hurdle rate, which is compounding and cumulative in nature. So in Stellavel Partners India Fund and in Complete Circle Stellavel PMS, we have got an annual compounding cumulative hurdle rate. In uh, the US, we have a 6% USD hurdle rate. And in India, we have an 8% annual INR hurdle rate. And I say cumulative and compounding, what does that mean? In year one, if the client makes zero, then at the end of year two, until the account value of the client has grown by 6% into 1.06, that is yeah. uh, 12.36%. At that time, I don't own a single penny from him. So 
this align this you no know, fee this is fee structure to me seemed very fair so you no know, i basically wrote to buffett uh, asking him that you know okay this is the fee structure which i'm planning to have you had 0625 i'm planning 0620 because when i run the numbers over 20 long years then this difference of 5% in performance fees was making a large difference to the client's eventual net results so i decided to lower the performance fees from 25% to 20% so in our fund we have 0620 What else would I like to see? I would like to see hundred percent skin in the game and alignment of interest by the fund manager. In my case, I told it, told you, all of my money is invested in my India fund, so that ensures a raises your focus on risk management and downside production, while the zero management fee incentivizes me to focus on return maximization. Okay. So clients get the best of both worlds, and both are PMS and our India fund because the incentives drive everything in the world. Because this is something which you yeah. learn over time that you set the right incentives. You get the right outcomes. If you set bad incentives, you'll get bad outcomes. It's all about incentives at the end of the day. Okay. So last question, Gautam sir. Ah, uh, like over last ten, fifteen years that you have been investing in the Indian equity markets, can you talk about few of your biggest winners and few of your biggest losers? Ah, uh, in the whole journey of like how you discovered those ideas, how the whole journey of holding them was, and what eventually made you to exit them, and Eventually, if there are some big learnings that came out of any of this investment, so again, a very good question, Ankur. I'll talk about the biggest loser first. I've talked about this in detail in my second book as well. Uh, the stock's name was Bandhan Bank, and I wish I had not read uh, this book called <laughs> Bandhan the Making of a Bank by Tabak Bandhan Pandey. Yes, I developed a liking bias for the promoter Chandrasekhar Ghosh after reading his story backstory of hardship, yeah. perseverance, and yeah. struggle. And as a result, I started overlooking all the problematic issues in the business, like over leverage among its borrowers in its poor markets of eastern and wow. northeastern India, yeah. deteriorating asset quality. And uh, you know, I kept justifying myself, okay, this you know this guy will eventually you know uh, improve the business, get it back on track, but it never happened. The stock eventually fell eighty to nine eighty percent plus from the all time high, and uh, I eventually exited the stock at a very big loss. So. The learning from for me from that big loss. In fact, the losses are the biggest teachers. I treasure them because yeah. you know I have a habit of documenting things anyway. So these losses basically teach you so many things. In this case, I got to learn that you know always separate the economics of the business from the personality of the promoter at the helm of the company. Don't you know uh, fall in love with managements and you know don't fall in love with your stocks. You know just you have to have a dispassionate, rational at attitude. In in the investing field, that's very very important. Just you know, focus on numbers. That is you know hard numbers and probabilities uh, rather than narratives. That is you know dramatic stories and futuristic narratives. Don't fall for all the, all those things. That was you know about the biggest loss. The biggest winner uh, again I talked about this in my second book. Uh, biggest winner was a twenty bagger in a stock named Raj Ratan Global Wire. I invested in the stock in June two thousand twenty. It was trading at a trailing P multiple of five times on depressed earnings because they were set up a new plant and undergone a very large capacity expansion. In two thousand eighteen, nineteen, and early two thousand twenty, the Indian auto industry was in a down cycle because of the uh, ILFS crisis, yeah. NBFC crisis. But after COVID, once the initial signs of recovery started taking place in the auto cycle, you know this uh, stock basically benefited from both operating leverage and uh, financial leverage. They paid on a debt. And also, you know, you had the valuation re-rating because the earnings growth came in at a fast clip. So the stock went up twenty times over the next twenty years. But uh, you know, after two years, you know, the reason the trigger for the exit was that the stock, you know, for a, such a cyclical business, you know, which is a you know ancillary of an ancillary, it's basically supplying B device for tires to yes. auto companies. So you know, it just started trading at a trailing P multiple more than fifty times. So. Basically, once you know whatever sell discipline or sell much selling method you follow in the market, always follow it consistently. It can be something as simple as, you know, once you once this stock crosses your valuation comfort threshold, then you can simple set a simple trigger like, okay, I'll set a trailing fifteen percent stop loss from the all time high. Once it falls fifteen percent from the all time high, I'll sell. Or it can be the break of a fifty day moving average, or the break of a twenty one day moving average, or a break of a two hundred day moving average. Or you can also combine something called a V stop in trading view. There are multiple uh, ways you can basically set your selling uh, trigger. But whatever method you use, you no, know, just stay consistent and disciplined to it. Because you know, if you try the hope, the reason why so many of these con funds do so well is because they have a dispassionate, objective method of entry and exit. That's why they end up doing so so well. 
the moment you start mixing your emotions in your self, self decision that is when you will you know start facing problems so you know look for when you are investing in a, uh, such a deep cyclical business the only thing you need to check is check the debt on the balance sheet and check whether they have sufficient operating cash flow to service the debt and run the operations comfortably for the next 2 years without resorting to equity dilution or any further debt issuance once all those parameters are in place then just buy as much quantity as you want because the industry is out of favor and then just patiently wait for the up cycle to begin because like howard marx has taught us most things are cyclicals and the biggest opportunities for gain or loss come when people forget that most things are cyclical okay got got uh those were very insightful discussion gotham sir uh eventually what we do is with each of this podcast in the end what we want to have is the key takeaway for our listeners in form of a business or an industry that is looking interesting to you at the moment and why like you don't necessarily have to take names given directional insights if you can share those would be very helpful for listeners i think uh, you know one thing which has worked a lot in the indian markets is you know trends are global okay trend, right. this is something very very important trends are global so if artificial intelligence ai is you know it's a global trend then it will eventually it will catch up in india as well so we do have uh, you know some listed data center plays you should definitely look at them because if microsoft is tying up you know with setting up nuclear plants to power their ai data right. centers up to 2050 if microsoft is saying that this is a 25 year old trend then you have to set up and take notice so you can look at a data center place you can look at a transformer place you have thankfully we have got enough listed place in the indian market to take care of and to participate in this particular multi decadal theme so definitely you know do your research wait for a dip or if you're comfortable with the current valuations and are willing to forego the returns for the first year then you can even enter right now because what i've seen from again from my experience is that the in these cases the returns from year 2 to year 5 compensate for the lack of returns in year 1 this is something again which i have learned with time so it all depends on how patient you are willing to be with your stocks got it got it got it so thank you once again gotham sir for doing this uh hope i think investors will gain a lot out of the discussion so thank you once again thank you so much ankush this was fun got it